Let's pray together. Lord, we're glad to be back in your house today. And we pray for your help to worship you well today. We've just marked a season of thanksgiving, Lord, and we have much to be thankful for. Uh, We're thankful uh, for you and the gift of salvation that you've given us in Jesus Christ, Lord. Um, We're thankful for each other, God, that we would have this special fellowship of faith here at First Baptist Church of Rock Mart. We pray for your help that we would be the church that you would want us to be, Lord. Holy given over to you, Lord, entirely dedicated to your will, God, for the sake of the gospel and the world around us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every person, every family that's represented here today, praying for your blessing upon them during this special time of the year. God, as we we remember together uh, the great uh, good news of uh, Christ coming into the world, Lord, and uh, we pray for your help uh, to share that good news with the world, Lord. Our world is hurting Uh, It's in need of good news, and we pray that uh, you would help us to do our part to turn the world's attention to you. Lord, be with us now as we lift up our hearts and our voices to you in worship. Help us to be uh, excellent with our given responsibilities during this worship hour. Thank you for your kindness to us that overflows into so many areas of our lives. Uh, We pray for your help with those who are hurting or grieving now, that they would be able to cast their cares upon you, knowing that you care for them. Uh, We thank you for the presence and the power of your Spirit manifest with us today. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And all God's people said, Welcome to worship today. Um, You know, your Thanksgiving travels uh, might have taken you uh, hither and yonder this week, maybe as, as, as close as your own dining room in your own house as all your family came to you. Maybe, uh, like me, you hit the road and it was a marathon sprint to places like Birmingham and then Knoxville, Tennessee and back down to Rock Mart. And um, at any rate, I'm so glad that God's people are back together in God's house today. Um, Today we begin to turn our uh, attention as a church to a special season of the year. Uh, Next Sunday officially marks the first Sunday of Advent, but uh, we had some folks who came yesterday to begin to beautify our church uh, for this coming special season. So if you were a part of that yesterday, thank you so much for the time and the dedication that you gave to help prepare our our church campus for this special time of the year. Uh, it, It helps us to prepare our hearts for this special time of the year. So thank you very much for that. Uh, By the way, my name's Jason. It's always my privilege to be a pastor and preacher here at First Baptist Church of Rock Mart. And I say that because uh, if you're a guest with us today, I'd love the chance to make your acquaintance. Uh, You're an honored guest, as always. Uh, We would ask our guests that you might fill out a a card at your convenience. They're located uh, in the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, It gives you a chance to give us some contact information if you want us to get in contact with you about our church to tell you more about what's going on at First Baptist Church of Rock Mart. Uh, Let me uh, uh, mention a couple of announcements. As I said, we're entering into a special season of the year, and in conjunction with this special season, we have some special events going on. First of all, uh, tonight at 6 p.m., we look forward to what I know is a a hallowed uh, church tradition. It's uh, the Roman Festival Brass in concert. But I'll tell you, uh, someone who could speak a little more knowledgeably to that than I can, because this will be my first time to sit in on this, would be Andrew Carter. Andrew, would you like to just say anything more about what's going on tonight? Well, yeah, yesterday I was somewhere. He was uh, somewhere where a football game was. Uh, you know. Well, anyway. Uh, so tonight, Roman Festival Brass will be in concert at 6 o'clock. And uh, for those who have never been to the Roman Festival Brass concert, uh, you're going to be in for a treat. And I'm, I'm not just speaking for myself since I'm the first trombone player, but uh, there's, there's several people from uh, from this area that are in this group. So you may know somebody who's up here besides me and my mother. Mother, Mom plays, uh, she plays, what is it, what, what do we officially call it? The E-flat, alto horn, tenor horn, something like that. It, it, so that's, that. she's, she's, in, the, she's in the group. Uh, there's several other people from here, educators that you may know. So uh, it's at six o'clock tonight here in the sanctuary. And uh, we'll be playing traditional Christmas music. We'll play a few uh, uh, you know, popular tunes and, and things like that that you've heard 
before. So come on out at 6 o'clock. Now, to get ready for this concert, we, we uh, have to do a little prep work up here at the front. So if we could have some folks stay after church just a little while. If we have, The more people we have, the less time it'll take. We've got to clear all this stuff off the, off the stage up here, the, the chairs, the all the chairs back here, the barricade here, the pulpit. We gotta, we gotta clear it all out for the band up here tonight. So if whoever can help us do that after church, we would certainly appreciate it. But six o'clock tonight, it's free admission. Uh, we would accept donations for the band, uh, and of course they're all tax deductible. Uh, but uh, we certainly appreciate your attendance tonight. If you can make it six o'clock right here in the church, Roman Festival Brass and Concert, and uh, you'll be in for some Christmas favorites. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. He's got that glow of a newly married man, doesn't he? <laughs> um, just to let you know about a couple other things that are coming up uh, uh, in the coming week. Um, we look forward as a community to the Rockmark Christmas Parade coming up Friday, uh, December 1st. And in conjunction with that, our church will be serving some hot chocolate. So uh, please come on by uh, uh, as the parade's going on um, and uh, enjoy some hot chocolate with us here at First Baptist Church. This coming Saturday, December 2nd, is our, the next meeting of our men's ministry, our, our men's brotherhood. Um, and instead of our regular November meeting and instead of our regular December meeting, we've uh, uh, um, uh, collapsed that into one special dinner, uh, lunch, if you will, uh, Saturday, December 2nd uh, at 1 p.m. And uh, uh, reservations would be appreciated, and you can see some contact information there in your bulletin. But again, that's coming up this coming Saturday, December 2nd, at 1 p.m. Uh, also coming up uh, Saturday, uh, the uh, FBC Women's Ministry has been so kind as to offer a parents' night out, uh, and that is taking place Saturday from 5 to 9. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, um, you, the deadline for those reservations is today, and you can see Stephanie Mears or Melissa Mathis about that. Uh, the last thing to let you know about is a week from today, you are all invited to the Odom's house for... Uh, a, a Christmas open house and social, um, and that's taking place next Sunday afternoon, December 3rd from 2 to 5 p.m. Uh, depending on whether our house is totally cleaned up at that time, we might or might not ask you to bring a broom or a dustpan or something like that. We have two young kids, what can I say? Um, at any rate, those are some of the things that are coming up in the next week of the life of our church. Thank you for everything that you'll do to play a part in this special season. Now, let me invite all of us. Just let's stand. Let's greet one another. Say hello to each other and uh, rejoice in the Lord together. Welcome to worship this morning. Let's, uh, let's start out our, our service with hymn number 243. We'll sing Emmanuel, then uh, right after that, number 244, uh, Come Thou Long Expect to Jesus. Number 243, Emmanuel.
Okay, please be seated. If you have your Bible, I invite you to take your Bible and please turn in your Bible to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. It's amongst the minor prophets there, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. If you go to Malachi, you've gone one too far. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. This is our Old Testament scripture reading for this morning. Once you found your place in sacred scripture, I invite you to follow along as I read it aloud. Zechariah 8, 1 through 17. Let's give attention now to the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff and hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you who in these days have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before those days there was no wage for man or any wage for beast, neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or came in, for I set every man against his neighbor." But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord of hosts. For there shall be a sowing of peace. The vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its produce, and the heavens shall give their dew. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And as you have been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus says the Lord of hosts, As I purposed to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts, so again have I purposed in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear not, these are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath for all these things I hate declares the Lord this is the word of the Lord thanks be to God please stand with us as we sing number 251 it came upon the midnight clear join us as we sing all four verses it came upon the midnight clear number 251 It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. Peace, 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just we want to thank you for bringing us back together today, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the holiday we just celebrated with Thanksgiving, Lord. Lord, we thank you for, for all that you've given to us, Lord, and, and for how gracious you've been to us. And Lord, we ask now that you would just help uh, take the offerings that we have today, Lord, as a small token of what you've done for us, and Lord, to use it for your kingdom. Lord, I ask that you bless Jason as he comes to bring the message today. I ask that you would uh, just fill his heart, Lord, and just let us uh, know what uh, you would have him to speak to us about. Pray now that you would help us to go out, Lord, and to be the light that you would, uh, you would have us to be. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. The first uh, song out of our Christmas musical for this year called Breath of Heaven. And uh, we hope you're able to come out to our Christmas program, which will be on December 17th, uh, Sunday, December 17th, that evening at 6. But we're going to give you a little bit of a sneak preview of the opening uh, piece from this called Emmanuel Shall Come. It features uh, hymns such as O Come, All, o come, o come Emmanuel, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and O Come All Ye Faithful. Emmanuel Shall Come.
If you have your Bible, would you take your Bible again? <clears throat> and this time, would you turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. So after a three-week pause to talk about the themes of kingdom and church and gospel, we resume our march through Matthew Beginning today with chapter 8, verse, verses 1 through 17. And when you have found your place in sacred scripture, I invite you to follow along as I read it aloud. Let's give attention again to the word of the Lord. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer of darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Just last month, the Spanish state of Catalonia declared independence from its mother country. On October 1st, Catalonian citizens voted to secede. On October 10, the regional president signed a declaration of independence. On October 27, the regional parliament passed its own resolution, likewise declaring for a free Catalonia. None of that is to say that Catalonia is now free and independent. Spain has challenged its bid for independence every step of the way, in Congress and in court. Spain continually asserts its authority over that region. The vote on October 1, the declaration on October 10, the resolution on October 27, all illegal, unconstitutional, says the Spanish Supreme Court. Spain says it reigns over Catalonia. Catalonia resists, compelling Spain to make a show of its authority. As I read the news reports, I realize I'm staring 
at my reflection. That is, in the struggle between Spanish authority and Catalonian resistance, I see the struggle between God and humanity, which is to say it's a struggle between God and me. Ever since Eden, humanity has denied God's authority. As our fallen, sin-sick, and rebellious behavior bears out, we repeatedly resist bowing before Him as Almighty Creator King. We repeatedly resist this because we know That not only does he have authority, but he also has an agenda. And so our resistance stiffens even more. We repeatedly resist bowing before him because we don't want to do what he wants us to do. Still, it's hard to ignore someone who heals with a word from his mouth or a touch of his hand. Uh, Someone who casts away demons as easily as disease might very well be worthy of our worshiping and our following. According to our text for this morning, Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 through 17, God reigns over disease. So we must admit his authority and adopt his agenda. Jesus has just finished delivering his famous Sermon on the Mount. The crowds are astonished. Now, in Matthew chapter 8 and almost all of chapter 9, Jesus continues astonishing, this time by making miracles. Matthew chapter 8 verse 1 through Matthew chapter 9 verse 34 consists of three groups of miracle stories. Each group consists of three stories. Matthew's point in relating them is to reinforce his incredible claim from chapter 1 verse 1 that Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed deliverer. The first trio of miracles covers chapter 8 verses 1 through 17. All these, it turns out, hang together not just because they're miracles, but because they all address people's physical ailments their illness and their sickness. Verses 1 through 4 talks about Jesus encountering the leper. Uh, Verse 1 notes that Jesus, with, with many people in tow, comes down from the mount where he had been sermonizing. Verse 2 then says, And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him. Leprosy is a long term bacterial infection it disfigures the skin it inflames the respiratory tract it deadens the nerves leading to the loss of extremities when injuries or infections go unnoticed or untreated leprosy is not that contagious but until that was learned in modern times lepers as a rule were cast out of society As a social outcast, the leper knows he's got to approach Jesus before Jesus gets into the next town. So he makes haste to get to Jesus. When he he gets to Jesus, despite how physically uncomfortable it must be given his condition, he he kneels before him. Lord, says the leper in verse 2, if you will, you can make me clean. Notice that the leper already believes Jesus can heal him. While kneeling and after calling Jesus Lord, he makes his request in terms of whether Jesus wants to heal him, not in terms of whether Jesus can heal him. In verse 3, Jesus in response, quote, stretched out his hand. Not only that, Jesus touches the leper. This is culturally inconceivable. It is socially shocking and it is religiously repugnant. Jesus, it appears, is trying to contract leprosy. Worse, he is defiling himself according to Jewish religious law which forbids touching someone or something that is ritually unclean. As onlookers gasp at what's going on, Jesus confirms the compassionate intent of his touch. I will, he says to the bowed leper, be clean. And that's all it takes for healing, total healing 
to happen. Instead of Jesus contracting leprosy, leprosy contracts Jesus. Instead of Jesus breaking the law on this point, Jesus makes the law moot. The leper is now free to return to society. But first, says Jesus in verse 4, he must go to the priest to officially declare him clean according to religious law. Then, also according to law, he must go to the temple in Jerusalem and offer uh, an offering. Uh, This will be, quote, a, a proof to them, meaning everyone who once knew him as a leper, that he is a leper no more. Jesus reigns over leprosy which is to say he reigns over disease. His authority is apparent. It is awe-inspiring, and it is absolute. It compels us not just to believe that he is Lord of disease, but to bow before him as Lord of all and to follow him as Lord of our lives. Jesus makes a miracle here, but there's more to it. There is more to him than that. Jesus doesn't just show out for the sake of showing off. It is a miracle with a mission. It is a performance with a purpose. It is an exercise of authority with an agenda in mind. Society had cast the leper out. By restoring his physical health, then Jesus restores him to society. Full health, wholeness for the leper means not just losing his leprosy, but regaining acceptance. This is the mission for which Jesus makes the miracle. This is the purpose for which he performs the amazing feat. And this is the agenda for which Jesus exercises his authority. Rejection is a disease in its own right It is a blight on society's soul like the disfigured patches on a leper's skin. If someone annoys us or or bothers us or even like a leper scares us, our all too human nature inclines us to exclude and isolate and ignore them. It's easier to just dismiss and disregard them than it is to love and care for them. Jesus doesn't stand for that. And neither should we as his disciples. Those whom society calls misfits and rejects and outcasts, we Christians call children of God, made in God's image and loved by God's love. That, quote, weird kid in class, that loner at work, that special needs individual next door belong to us and we to them. The gospel, after all, aims not just to restore us to fellowship with God, but to restore us to fellowship with fellow man and fellow woman. Having come down from the mount where he'd been preaching and in from the countryside where he had just met the leper. Jesus now, in verse 5, enters Capernaum. Capernaum is next to the Sea of Galilee. It's where Jesus settled when he moved out of Nazareth at the start of his ministry. Before Jesus can get into the house and take a load off, quote, a centurion came forward to him. A centurion is an officer in the army of the Roman Empire, which, in Jesus' day, occupies the Jewish homeland. As his title indicates, the centurion commands about a hundred men. What is most significant about the following exchange, though, is that he is a non-Jew, a Gentile. The centurion comes to appeal to Jesus. Lord, he says, my servant is lying paralyzed at home. Uh, To stress the dire straits that he's in, the centurion adds that he is, quote, suffering terribly. We don't know the particulars of the servant's paralysis. At any rate, his prospect for medical cure is nil. So, like the leper, the centurion tracks down Jesus. Also, like the leper, the centurion calls Jesus Lord. A highly unusual gesture, given the centurion's higher social status. Jesus understands the situation. 
Jesus understands the centurion's higher social status, and he also understands his own people's prohibition against Jews entering the homes of non-Jews. Verse 7 then translates better as a question. You're asking a Jew to enter the home of a Gentile? Jesus isn't airing his own prejudice here, but rather his own people's prejudice. He airs it because, in fact, he's about to flip that prejudice on its self-righteous head. In the meantime, in verse 8, the centurion responds innocently, humbly, and movingly. Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word, and my servant will be healed Only say the word and my servant will be healed. The rest of the centurion's response is revealing. Quote, for I too am a man under authority, he says in verse 9. That is to say, the centurion knows authority when he sees it. And he sees it in Jesus. Just as the centurion commands his subordinates to come and go, he believes that Jesus can likewise command his servant's paralysis to go away and without Jesus having to take one step inside his home. Whenever Matthew says that someone marvels, it's always at Jesus, except this one time. This time, in verse 10, Jesus marvels. It's it's delight, sheer delight at hearing a non-Jew talk like Jesus wishes his hometown crowd, the Jews, would talk. In fact, Jesus whirls right around to his entourage and says, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. This is a moment here. For a moment, Jesus and company catch a glimpse, thanks to the centurion's expression of faith, Jesus and company catch a glimpse of glory. It's a future glory in which believers, believers from all people groups stream in from all over the planet and join with the Jews, God's first chosen people, represented here by the family heads of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Together, says Jesus, they will, quote, recline at table, meaning they will celebrate and they will live together under God's everlasting reign and rule. As I said, Jesus is flipping his people's prejudice on its self-righteous head. What's more, in verse 12, Jesus warns that while non-Jews will come into the kingdom, some Jews Uh, Sons of the kingdom, he calls them. Some Jews will find themselves outside looking in. Ancestry, it turns out, isn't the key to getting into God's kingdom. The key is that for which Jesus now commends the Gentile centurion. Faith. Faith is the key to getting into God's kingdom. To both commend his faith, And to crown the vision that it's inspired. Jesus in verse 13 says to the centurion. Go. Let it be done for you as you have believed. The report then reads uh, all too matter of factly for such a momentous occasion. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Jesus reigns over paralysis like he reigns over leprosy. His show of authority aims to convince naysayers and non-believers alike to join the song that, quote, Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of my thoughts and my service each day. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus makes another miracle here. But again, there is more to it than that. The miracle isn't merely the end of the servant's paralysis, but the means of Jesus revealing more of his agenda. While healing the servant of a non-Jew, Jesus reveals his intent to welcome all God's people into his kingdom. Like rejection, racism is all too characteristic of fallen humanity. Humanity perversely likes to stratify and then segregate itself according to race and 
ethnicity. Even God's chosen people, the Jews, were not immune to this impulse. Jesus, though, denounces racism, which is all the cue we disciples need to do the same. Heaven is one big holy hodgepodge of folks from all walks of life. Since our citizenship as believers is already there, what do you think our attitude toward race and ethnicity should be right now? I was thinking about this yesterday. Have you ever noticed that race is a non-issue when a guy is running for a touchdown in the championship game? Surely then the rest of life, to say nothing of the church, ought to be that way too. The third and final miracle in this group begins in verse 14. After parting ways with the centurion, Jesus enters Peter's house. This might mean that Jesus lives there, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is that today uh, there's a remnant of a house beside the Sea of Galilee, that is recognized and revered as this very house, Peter's house, which Jesus now enters. Inside, Jesus learns that Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. We don't get any of the dialogue like the first two stories. Verse 15 simply says that Jesus touches the ill woman's hand. The fever flees from her. She then gets up and begins to host her healer. All in all, this is a relatively, what, mundane story of yet another miraculous healing by Jesus? Word uh, of Jesus' homecoming, uh, perhaps including his most recent healings, uh, has apparently spread. Verse 16 says that that evening Jesus is inundated with visitors hoping that he might heal them too. They vary from those supernaturally ill, possessed by demons, to those naturally ill, like the leper and the paralytic and the fevered mother-in-law. As for the demons, the rest of verse 16 says that Jesus, quote, cast out the spirits with a word. Jesus says, go on and get And they go on and get. Demons, it turns out, can't resist Jesus any more than disease. For that matter, Jesus likewise, quote, healed all who were sick. Supernatural or natural, it all falls under his authority and it all caves to his command. Matthew, we recall, likes to point out when Jesus fulfills prophecy. In verse 17, then, Matthew reminds his readers of something from Isaiah. In Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, the prophet looks forward to a Savior who will bear the woes of the world in order to heal the world. As Matthew reads it, those woes include both sin and sickness. And as Matthew reports it, Jesus heals both. Jesus reigns over fever, like he reigns over paralysis, like he reigns over leprosy. For that matter, he reigns over demons, uh, like he reigns over disease. He flat out, out and out, without a doubt, give a shout, shut your mouth, reigns. He shows that he reigns in order to reveal. He heals that he might Herald, he makes miracles to make known that he is Messiah or Christ, God's anointed deliverer. He's come into this world to deliver people from sin, the most devastating disease of them all. As part of establishing his authority over sin, then Jesus heals some people of their physical ills, like Peter's mother-in-law from her fever. Peter's mother-in-law gets up. And gets to work serving Jesus as soon as Jesus heals her. This seems insignificant at first. But really, it signifies another aspect of Jesus' agenda. You see, besides bringing the marginalized of society back into the mainstream, and besides welcoming all peoples into God's kingdom, Jesus wants to free folks from sin in order to serve Him. We believers have been saved 
from sin. That fever, the fever of sin sickness has passed and it is gone for good. It is high time then that we, you and I, get up off our spiritual sickbed and start serving the one who has healed us. Jesus has authority and he has an agenda. So what are we waiting for when it comes to getting with his program? Jesus says elsewhere, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Having been healed to the uttermost, on a soul level, you and I can respond as Isaiah does. Here am I, Lord, send me. Jesus goes on to make many more miracles like these. Um, He delivers the sick from sickness. Uh, the demon possessed from demons, he even delivers the dead from death. All these mighty works attest to his authority as God's anointed deliverer as Christ. Amazingly though, for all the miracles that he makes, his authority is not universally recognized at the time. The world doesn't just fall at his feet. Some folks remain skeptical about him. Some folks harden in their hearts toward him. Some folks even conspire to kill him. And in time, they succeed. Jesus, of course, is dead and buried for just a few days. Eternally speaking, that's about how long the doubts about him and his lordship will endure. Just as Jesus returned to life victorious over death, he will one day return to this world and he will put on a show of authority to end all shows. It will end all doubt as well as all disobedience stemming from doubt. What Jesus does in our text for this morning is but, as the old hymn says, a foretaste of glory divine. Jesus reveals his authority but by no means is it the full measure. The, the, leper, the leper and his friends are just a warm-up act. The full measure of his might awaits a final revealing when his father says, All right, son, go on back into the world now and round up my children. Jesus reveals his authority because he's got an agenda. When he returns, his agenda will include ridding the world of sin, making the world new again, and bringing God's children into his forever kingdom. As for disease, like the ones he heals in this text, they too will be utterly defeated. In the coming kingdom, we are totally saved from sin and sickness alike. God reigns over disease So we must admit his authority and adopt his agenda. Let's pray. Help us, O God, to bow the knee in our hearts before you in recognition of your authority. And help us, God, to give ourselves over to your agenda. Lord, as we've read uh, and learned from our text this morning, we know that your agenda is, Uh, includes bringing the marginalized of society uh, back into the mainstream. We understand that your agenda includes the disillusion of any racism, God. We understand that your agenda includes uh, freeing us from sin, that we would all serve you, Lord, with our whole hearts and everything that's in us. Help us, Lord, to be found faithful in obeying your word. And we pray this in your name, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Uh, so we now begin to respond. Um, you know, the way it works is this, we begin to respond as we stand and sing in a moment, but really the response time takes up uh, about the next seven days, you know, because the way that we live in the coming week will show the ways that we respond to what we've heard from God's word and the experience we've had in God's house today. So this begins our response time. And, and maybe for some of you, the, the proper response is to come forward to share with us the good news that you've become a Christian. Uh, maybe the proper response is for you to come forward to join our church in membership and partner with us here at First Baptist in proclaiming the gospel and doing good works together. Uh, maybe the right response is for you to come forward uh, to follow through with your baptism, having already confessed Christ. 
If you want to pray, I could pray with you uh, for a moment, but you, you'd be welcome to come down here as well and to pray uh, at these steps, uh, to make it an altar, if you will. But uh, we begin our response time now, and we're going to stand and sing and respond as the Spirit of the Lord would lead us. Andrew. Thank you.